Hello everyone, this is a report on the Murray River, located in Australia. This is performed by Jason Krantz and is for the Environmental Science 665 Water Resource Management at Marshall University. So let's talk about some facts about the Murray. Well, first off, the Murray River is over 2,500 kilometers long. It is one of the, it's the third largest river in the world. Second, the river itself travels over three states in Australia, so it's a very big part of the Australian landscape. The Murray River also has a lot of irrigation and water controls. As you can see, it lists uh, over many locks, weirs, and two major dams helping to control the water flow in along in the along the Murray River. And the water from the Murray River serves over 1.5 million homes. So this is a major water source for the southern portion of Australia. So what are some of the attractions along the Murray? Well, we've got some of the most beautiful golf courses in all the world are located in the Murray. You can see here. And this picture shows you a beautiful landscape right along with one of the Murray tributaries. Then you've got canoe races. This is something that is huge. The, the world's largest canoe race. It takes place right along the Murray River. You can see this is a nice picture of some canoe races. And then fishing. The Murray River is a tremendous fishing location. It has some of the most amazing fish. This example you can see of this gentleman holding what's called the Murray Cod. The Murray Cod, by the way, is an amazing fish. It's almost two meters in length and it's average size. So that's quite a catch, the Murray Cod. So let's look at the population of Australia. As you can see in this map, the, the center area of the map here, no one lives in. This is desert. There, it's a vast wasteland, very hot temperatures. There's almost no water whatsoever in the central part of, this, of the country. Now, you get a little bit of more people along the edges, but down here in the bottom right, you can see this is where the population lives. These are where all the major cities are that belong in these, in these three states. And you can see these. This is Southern Australia. This is um, Victoria and South Wales. So those are a couple of uh, the three main states that really hold the mo most population in the, in the country of Australia. And then guess where the Murray River is? Well... Let me show you where the Murray River is. It is right here in what they call the Murray-Darling Basin. You can see those three states we talked about. Well, these, this area here is the basin, Murray-Darling Basin region. And this is where most of the water is for the entire country. Now, the people who live around here, we have 23 million people living in Australia. I've shown you here where the Murray-Darling River Basin is, and everywhere else in Australia is basically desert. A few exceptions, but for the most part, desert area. Now let's look at this map. This map is, you can see in this little part here, it shows you the Murray River and where it runs through South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. So you can see here, if you look at this part, each one, the Murray starts here in some of these tributaries. We have tributary here, some smaller rivers that lead into it, but this is the main Murray waterway. And you can see, guess where all the cities are? Right along the Murray River. Now remember, this is a big, a very long river. We're talking about the third largest in the world. Um, we're talking about this river is the main water source for this entire southern area. And, and like I said, this is where all the people live. 
So this is really important to understand the, the river and the towns that are connected to it. Now, another part of this, I mentioned before, water control systems. Well, they have 15 locks, what they call navigational locks, 16 storage weirs, and two, uh, two dams. So if you look at this area, this map shows you all of the locks, weirs, and dams and barrages that are located throughout the Murray River. And they are all over. Here, everyone in orange, you can see they're controlling the water flow. Now, they're controlling it for a couple of reasons, and I'll get to that. But you can see that it's heavily controlled throughout this entire territory. And it really makes a big difference on preserving the water for the area. But Murray, Locks, Weirs, and Dams are a big, big piece of this. Okay, so now that we know a little bit of background around the Murray River and its locations, let's talk a little bit about what are they doing and what some of the challenges on the Murray. Well, the Murray's been around for a long time and because the area is so dry you know Australia has been fighting drought for several decades now and because they're fighting drought irrigation is a big part of it there's just not a lot of rainfall so what do they do when you don't have a lot of rain you need to irrigate the water you do have. And because there's so little rain, they're basically over irrigating the entire Murray River. Part of that is due to those water controls, uh, diverting water in a different directions, taking water to farmland. You can see here, here's an image of the Murray River, and look how high the banks are. I mean, the banks go way up in this part of the area, but there's just no water. There's just no water. And this is part of the challenge. How much irrigation can you even get from this part of the river? Not much at all. If you look at some of the statistics and the three states that are involved in the Murray River, you've got South Wales. They are one of the bigger users, bigger users of the Murray River over you can see here 1665 gilliliters a year compared to only 535 for South Australia but then you look at the percentage of the territory that's irrigated from this so um, it's fascinating if you look at the numbers a lot of total a lot of farm area in this and a lot of crops that use a lot of water so there's a lot of irrigation the key number, I think, that really explains a lot in this is this number right here. 42% of the land, in average, in these three states is irrigated farmland. That is a tremendous amount of territory for irrigation, and that's a lot of water required to keep things going. So you can tell that's going to be a big part of the problems that are involved in the Murray River. Some additional challenges, salt. Well, you've obviously, Australia has, is a continent, it's a country, it is surrounded by seawater, but it has challenges with salt. And all of their fresh water is growing in salinity concentrations. So if you look at this graph, you can see here in 1920, the salinity, which is measured here in ECs, was less than 500, which is which is not great, but it's okay. That's not a bad number. But as the years have passed, it is continuing to rise, and the salinity of the territory is rising. There's a slight dip right here. But you can see that it goes down and then it's going back up. And now the future, which we're probably right in here somewhere, 
the future, the future, uh, the salinity in the water and the Murray River is a real, real threat. Salinity in the water causes problems for everybody, not just drinking. You notice that it talks about here that 800 ECs is the maximum uh, Australian desirable limit for drinking. So you, you don't want to, if you get it above that, it's you can't drink it anymore. The other things you have to consider is that the salt for these areas, not only does it affect the drinking ability, but it also affects the plant life. It affects the, the fish life in the river. It affects everything when it comes to how the Murray River will survive. And so the salinity concentrations is something that they're really working hard to try to, to correct. And I'll tell you something about that here in just a little bit. Some environmental challenges that come along with the Murray River is they have what's called acid sulfate soils. And if you look at this example, you can see the, the salinity and the drought in the water will cause acid sulfates to build up. And that is deadly, a deadly chemical combination for the Murray River. And you can see that yellow in there, that's, that's trouble. Second, we've got blue-green algae. Now, this is a real problem. Now, a lot of areas have blue-green algae, even West Virginia has, has had times of blue-green algae. But algae bloom is what they call it. But if you, because of droughts, and there's just this lack of flushing, you know, if you think about storms that are coming through an area and they wash out the area, well, they don't have those storms. They don't have that flushing ability. And so what happens is that the algae builds up and gets stronger and thicker. And then all of a sudden, it blooms. And when it blooms, it, everything turns green and blue. And that's bad because you can't drink it. You can't do anything with it. You can't feed cattle. You can't bathe in it. You can't let animals get in it. I mean, it is a real, real problem. So blue-green algae is a problem that is devastating parts of the Murray River. And then finally, with drought, leads in to what's called, what they call alien or invasive species. Now, some of the alien invasive species that I'm referring to here are some of the native plants. If you think about the normal plant life that lives along the river, and I'll tell you about these fish in just a second, but along this, these fish, um, excuse me, the plants and the trees, these plant life are significantly adjusted by the drought. And so some plants are more tolerant to that, and they end up taking over the entire area. Then you have problems with fish. So I showed you earlier a picture of the Murray cod, or Murray, yeah, Murray cod. And that's a native fish for that area. But it's really having a challenge right now because there's been this infiltration of a fish that's more... It has a, a greater ability to survive in some of these drought-tolerant areas, and it's called the European carp. Now, in this picture, you can see this gentleman here. He's holding European carp because there's there's so there's so many of them that in this case they're attracted to a freshwater inlet. Even though they're more resilient to salt water, they still want fresh water. So in this case. They're all piled together because they're trying to get more of the fresh water from an inlet, and they've died, and they're they're blocking up and, and diminishing the area from normal fish life. So those are some some real challenges when it comes to invasive species. Another example, I don't have a picture of it here, but there's a something called lipograssis. They're very uh, drought tolerant, and they're taking over a lot of the riverside uh, from normal vegetation. So lipograsses, the European carp, and then another little fish called the plague minnow. 
thousands and thousands of the plague men are there. Uh, much more resilient to this type of drought, low water tolerances, and so they're they're plaguing the area. So we've got a few solutions here. The first thing is that they have in instituted what's called a water embargo, meaning nobody else is allowed to have any water irrigated or taken from the Murray River. And they haven't given out any new water embargo since 1975. Um, they did make a change to one of their to the embargo system and they call it water entitlements. And basically that means that since 1983 they created a system to where people could transfer their water entitlements between users. So if, for example, one farm hand has enough water this year, and they say, well, I've, got, I've already used all the water I need, I'm going to give it to my neighbor. They can transfer those entitlements to a neighbor, and they can share without having to give up their normal amounts, because it's a temporary thing. So water entitlement transfers are, are a new thing, but they're working really well. And then we have what's called salt inception schemes. Now this is really, really amazing. So salt inception schemes, let me show you the scheme, excuse me. Let me show you the picture. <clears throat> Here is one of the pumping stations. So for example, part of the problem and that salt is getting into the Murray River is because the groundwater around the Murray River has a very high salinity levels. And so what the government has figured out to do is they take, they find these areas of very high salt content and they literally pump the water from the groundwater resources there and they pump it and they transport it miles away to one of the stations you see right here. And basically they keep pumping thousands and thousands of gallons of high saline water to this area and then they basically they, they release it it goes into the soil and this helps to keep this high saline content water away from the Murray River because in the past that water would move directly into the Murray River and that would create a higher salinity level well, now that we're moving the water out of the groundwater, the salt water, out of the groundwater into another part of the country, it doesn't get involved with the regular water systems. And so it's much, much better. And they're seeing major decreases in the salinity levels because of this new process, salt inception schemes. So that's pretty brilliant. So what's next for the Murray in Australia? Well, they've got a lot of challenges. You know, the predictions, the climate studies are showing that greenhouse gases are increasing and that the we're predicting 10% less rainfall up through the next 15, 20 years. This is going to see a more extreme drought and spikes in flooding which makes the area very challenging. The country is investing money into desalination plants. Now, this helps use some of that vast levels of seawater, uh, but it's very expensive. Desalination plants are very costly and take a lot of money to maintain and keep going. Uh, they do help with water, so that is part of the future of the Murray and Australia. More conservation. You know, the, the area has lots of conservation already in place. Restricted areas, they, they don't allow more people to tap into the Murray. They have a lot of government control uh, and there's only going to be more of that as the Murray continues to reduce its water levels. So the future is bleak for Australian water. I can see the next 20 years potentially transforming that center part of Australia that's already desert 
to expand its desert horizons down farther into the southern area. That's the last hope of water. water. So I appreciate your time. I hope that this has enlightened you a little more about the Murray River and Australia's water in a whole. And I appreciate you watching. Thank you.